Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Chats with Cat on the Voice of Adoptees podcast. I am your host, Cat, and I hope everyone is having a great week so far. Don't forget to grab your coffee, your tea, or a preferred beverage. I have water and settle on in. I am currently here with Grace, and she conducts adoption research for her PhD in cultural anthropology. So, Grace, welcome. Just briefly introduce yourself to those who are listening. All right. Hi, Kat. Thank you so much for having me on here. Like Kat said, my name is Grace. I'm a, let's see, fifth year PhD candidate through Michigan State University, and I'm getting my PhD in cultural anthropology and doing research on transnational adoption from Asia. More specifically, I'm looking at the ways that Asian, uh, East and Southeast Asian transnational adoptees who are raised in white households in the U.S. I look at how they or we form community and a sense of racial identity, mainly through kind of social media, or at least looking at the role that social media has played in kind of coming to terms with identity, both as Asian Americans and adoptees. So that's kind of the elevator pitch of my work. But yeah, I'm really happy to be here this evening. So thank you guys so much for giving us this opportunity. Oh, yeah, of course. And honestly, I didn't I didn't realize the extent and the depth of your PhD proposal and what you're researching. So this is very exciting to discuss and talk about. So let's get into a little bit about you first. So just tell us about your adoption background. Yeah, so um, I identify myself as a transnational, transracial, Chinese American adoptee, and that's a mouthful. And I have yet to figure out a shorter, more concise way to throw that all together. But basically I was born likely in 1996 in China, in the Zhejiang province, and adopted in November of 1997. So I was about a year and a half old when I was adopted. I was adopted by a mother and a father who are white and both from Minnesota. I grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota for my entire childhood in a um, you know, upper middle class. Um, I wouldn't say suburban because we were in the city, but quasi-suburban upbringing. Minneapolis is a pretty residential city, but with a lot of like cool life and culture. So I actually, I loved growing up there. It was definitely very isolated for me in terms of like being around other Asian Americans or other people of color in general. I went to a small private school there and was in pretty small high schools. So yeah, I, I didn't really know any other Asian Americans. Growing up in my family, adoption was talked about pretty openly. Obviously, when you're a different race than your parents, it's no secret that you're adopted. But I haven't met any transracial adoptee who had that be a secret, although I'm sure there's at least one out there. But yeah, so, you know, I always knew I was adopted. I also have a younger sister who is not biologically related to me, who was adopted from China as well. She's four years younger than me and was adopted five years after I was, I'm pretty sure can't quite remember now, but she's four years younger than me. And so I also had her. So yeah, growing up was pretty, we were pretty open about adoption. Um, I will say, you know, uh, I hear from a lot of ado- other adoptees that there was this really heavy, like savior rhetoric that their parents raised them with. I wouldn't say my parents enforced that on me in any overt ways. It definitely came from other people in our community, family, friends, obviously you know, media representations of adoption tend to be very focused on we saved you from this poor country or, you know, unfit family. And we can get into why that's harmful later on. But yeah, so I would say adoption was talked about in a fairly nuanced way in my household where my parents were pretty careful to acknowledge that adoption in our family came out of multiple losses for people involved. So my adoptive mother would always kind of acknowledge that, you know, my birth parents, my birth mother, especially, you know, experienced a loss and that loss being me. My, she acknowledged that I also lost my connection to her. And then my parents experienced infertility and that's why they adopted. So they also experienced a kind of loss from, you know, what they thought their life was going to be like. So in that way, I think, I was pos- very well positioned to sort of take a more nuanced approach with adoption, which kind of led me to my research later on. I will say they were not, my parents were not perfect, as no one's parents are, but 
And there were ways in which, especially race, was something that they did not know how to talk about, and they still don't know. And thinking about adoption in terms of kind of transnational politics, economic strife, that kind of stuff, that wasn't something they really thought about or talked to me or my younger sister about. But kind of the emotional toll that adoption has and the fact that adoption is complicated, that was something that was, we had space, I would say, to talk about it and have those feelings growing up, which it's hard to ever say you're grateful for anything as an adoptee, but that is something I can at least appreciate from my childhood. Yeah. Right. I was very surprised to hear how, not sympathetic, I, I think there's a different word that I just can't think of necessarily, but how open they were. And it brings me joy because a lot of adoptive parents aren't necessarily as open. And what I'm really shocked about and comforted by is that they introduced you to the idea that adoption starts with a loss. And this is mm -hmm. something that is really not spoken about among adoptive parents to the adoptee. And I think it is something that is important to discuss openly because you're right. Adoption starts with loss. It starts with the loss from the biological mother, the adoptive parents, mm -hmm. and also the adoptee. So it's great that they acknowledge your space in that as well. It's, it must have felt very validating in a way. Yeah. You know, for me growing up, it was interesting because I look back on it now and I'm like, yes, that was validating. And it's also meant that where I am now, I'm 27, almost 28, like as an adult doing adoption research, I can still have conversations about my work and my changing perspectives on adoption with my adoptive parents, which is rare, is very rare. And so yeah. I, that, again, that's something I just really appreciate about my relationship with them. But growing up, because I didn't want to talk about adoption stuff at all. I um, So my mom would almost kind of try and get me to hold space for, you know, the pain or uh, kind of navigating my own trauma. And then she would try and create spaces where we could talk about that. And I would, I was just very uninterested in having that conversation. So I had this weird kind of opposite right. thing that I think a lot of my kind of adoptee colleagues, fellow adoptees, experience where I had plenty of space to have complicated feelings about it. So yeah, my parents never kind of threw that stuff about be, like, being grateful if I ever had something. They never threw gratitude or something in my face, but they also really wanted me to kind of talk and experience these emotions that I wasn't ready to have. And I think now that I'm older and I've done more research on adoption and different waves of adoption, especially from Asia, I've kind of come to learn that the way that they were handling or framing adoption in the way that they raised my sister and me is that they got a lot of wisdom from older adult Korean adoptees who had already been advocating for adoptee voices and the podcast and um, adoptee rights and justice. They had been advocating for that for a while. And these messages about adoption as being something that is traumatic those were given to my parents when they were preparing to adopt. And so they had gotten yeah, this wisdom from adult Korean adoptees and their advocacy. And that is something that I, in turn, benefited from in the way that my parents raised me. Of course, there are also other Asian or er, adoptive parents of Asian kids who got those same messages and chose not to hold that space and chose to ignore everything that the adult Korean adoptees were saying. But my parents tried to do that. I just wasn't interested in that. And I think they didn't really know how to handle my disinterest. Yeah. And when I think back now, I realize it's because I wasn't as like, for me, I wanted to understand myself as an adoptee or as an Asian American as part of something bigger. I wasn't interested in focusing on these individual feelings I was having. It was more, I found sort of my, my adoptee voice, I guess, through um, understanding sort of yeah. I, yeah, I had that through kind of finding my role in the world, like yeah. um, in understanding race and identity and global power structures. And it's like, oh, this is how I fit into this world, not through someone that was traumatized or. Um, yeah, yeah, I had a lot of issues with kind of how I felt like I was being pathologized by people in general. If you're traumatized, I'm like I might be, but that's between me and my therapist. <laughs> Right. So I have a few questions because your story, yeah. I have to be honest, to me is very unique. I've not yet 
interviewed someone with this sort of perspective, and I want to know a little bit more about it. So when did you feel ready? Because here you are, what it is, is you're in a state of, I don't want to talk about it. Don't want to talk about it. I am me and I'm just going to go through my life and I'm going to find my place in the world. I know I'm adopted. It's fine. I see how my adoption works with the rest of the world. I don't want to focus on that. And then you turn inward and you go, no, I have to focus on this in order to move forward. When was that point for you? I think it was kind of gradual. A lot of what started just kind of like thinking critically about the world for me was in high school. And when I was in high school, both Mike Brown and Trayvon Martin were murdered by the police. And so that's kind of when I saw discussions of like, how does systemic racism work? And, you know, being like witnessing, right, the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, that kind of stuff helped kind of just shifted the way I understood the world and therefore shifted the way I understood my place in it. And so it was kind of through other kind of being introduced to other frameworks about identity and power that I started to realize, oh, I'm approaching this differently than my white friends. Most of my friends growing up were white. So I'm approaching this differently than my white friends or than my parents are. The way I'm implicated in, you know, global white supremacy, for example, is not going to be the same as my white Irish mom's role in this. And so when I started doing research on like Asian American identity or Asian American activism or solidarity or anything like that, I realized I also don't fit in here, right? Um, This doesn't make any sense to me because a lot of it was about rallying Asian American communities. And I was like, I don't have that. I don't know any Asian Americans. And so that's when I started getting interested in, in like, what does being Asian American mean to me? So for me, it was very much through developing my racial identity. What does being Asian American mean to me? And so my undergraduate senior thesis, I did like a um, autoethnography on myself. And because that's kind of, I don't know, there was, I can't even point to a moment where I realized, oh, adoption is kind of the weird link or the uh, sort of the missing piece of my puzzle of putting myself together. So I'm not exactly sure how that happened. It was just kind of realizing how different I was from other Asian Americans. And then I decided to explore that through my undergraduate thesis, which was basically looking at using food to navigate adoptee identity. And so I, I mean, this was a while now, so bear with me while I try and remember. But basically, I made a couple different dishes from the region of China that I'm from and sort of kind of journaled and wrote about how I felt and how I was experiencing this kind of attempt to reconnect to my culture and realizing like, I feel guilty for not wanting to eat an entire fish with eyes on it because I grew up in Minnesota and we don't eat things with a face still, you know, and realizing, oh, does that make, you know, am I Asian enough? Am I, is that, am I betraying my people by not wanting to eat this like pretty much still moving fish? And so, I mean, the like big reveal of that is kind of that trying to challenge the idea of like cultural authenticity for myself and knowing like me being adopted as part of how I am Asian. I can't like for my Asian-ness is is very intimately linked to me being adopted. And so me maybe preferring Chinese American food to Chinese food is part of my Asian American history. So that, and so by doing that research, I also found out, oh, adoption studies, like people have done this before. People have researched adoption. And so I found a lot of Asian adoption scholars like Kim Park Nelson and Kimberly McKee, I found their work and realized that they're, you know, that kind of opened up these possibilities for me if I could do more, but I was a graduating senior at the time. So my time for kind of undergraduate education was coming to a close. I was a religious studies major in undergrad. So it, I was like, I don't know how to get a job later on. So why don't I just go straight through to grad school? So that's kind of how I ended up in grad school was having these unanswered questions that I wanted to know more about being afraid to enter the quote real world. And yeah, just wanting to kind of pursue this other line of sort of understanding myself through research. And I will say the caveat I tell every adoptee adoption scholar is that intellectualizing adoption is not the same thing as therapy and processing it. So please do both. Right. That's what I 
usually has to right. tell because I'm like, oh, I should go to grad school to process my adoptions. Like, no, grad school is a very stressful, horrible process. It will not bring you mental stability. <laughs> I want to revisit a topic that you brought up. It's a concept that I am familiar with, and I want to know if I'm understanding it and interpreting what you're saying correctly. For me, I'm adopted from Russia, right? I was adopted into a white Mm -hmm. family. There was no talk of adoption. I couldn't, I wasn't even allowed to learn my language sort of thing. Mm. Now I'm living in the city and there's a lot of Russian, like, people from Russia here. And Mm -hmm. I'm too American to be Russian, but I'm also too Russian to be American. And I want to know if that's the sort Mm -hmm. of sentiment that you got in terms of your identity, where it's kind of like, I don't really fit into this circle, but I also don't really fit into this circle. So where am I supposed to be? And I, I think it's a very interesting concept, just because a lot of adoptees obviously struggle with identity. Everyone struggles with it a little bit differently. And I'm, I'm just really empowered by how it motivated you to, to kind of figure yourself out through food, which I didn't even think of, you know. And when you talk about the, the differences, obviously, between Chinese American food and Asian American food and how it is over in those countries, it is night and day. And it's very similar over here, mm-hmm. I think, in, in the States for, for um, Russians as well. It's a little bit yeah. different, you know. It only finds so much eth- like authentically ethnic foods, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I definitely don't think either of us is alone in feeling that kind of in-betweenness. Everyone I've interviewed now for my research has said the same thing, you know, um, as adoptee social media and adoptee podcasts like this one grow, I hear the sentiment echoed a lot, which is just like, yeah, not feeling enough for either side. And whether that, yeah, your like birth culture and the one that you're adopted into, because oftentimes, yeah, those are different. And yeah, I think it was something that, oh yeah. I guess what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to ask for clarity on like, what is, what is one thing that you have noticed and how it impacts the identity journey for the adoptee? Like, how did it impact you versus what have you noticed how it's impact others in your research? Yeah, I think it can be feel kind for like, for me, I have always been someone who I feel that it's unfortunate. I wish I wasn't this way, but I process a lot of my probably grief through being angry or feeling kind of spiteful about things. So it's kind of like, oh, I'm not Asian enough for you. Well, then I'm going to go do Asian American studies and uh, do that. Right. So yeah, this PhD is brought to you by sheer spite, but um, <laughs> Same. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think for me, it was just kind of feeling angry of like, well, yeah, if I, you know, it was obviously made very clear to me growing up by everyone around that I am not white, but that whiteness still kind of wanted to claim me as well in this weird way of like, friends saying, oh, I forget that you're Asian or you're just, or you're like us, you know, or even white people saying, oh, you speak really good English and stuff of like, just kind of this thing of, oh, you're Asian, but you're also one of us. And then getting older and kind of being able to explore Asian American and Asian communities on my own, realizing that they weren't necessarily interested in me. So for me, I got kind of angry about it because it was like, okay, well, what the heck do you want from me then? What am I supposed to do with all of this when I try and relate to you all? I know other people have obviously also felt a ton of grief as I did too, of like kind of feeling like there's a second abandonment happening when they try and reconnect with their culture and it feels like their culture doesn't want them back. And so, yeah, it hurts. (laughs) It hurts and it's confusing. And so I think that's why a lot of people kind of find this sort of third, more flexible space in navigating adoptee identity, because that is a space where I think there aren't the same expectations in the Asian adoptee community. Whenever I'm with other Asian transnational adoptees, you know, we don't expect that we understand the language or we don't expect that we have these little cultural norms like for Asian Americans, as well as many other people, you know, taking your shoes off when you come into an Asian household is really important. Right. That's Just not right. something that happens in a lo- some white American household. It did in mine, actually. And so that was something when I was Same. 
grow when I kind of was like, oh, I want to reclaim like my Asianness, the taking my shoes off when I go inside. I was like, whoo, okay, that one I did right at least. Right. But like washing my rice, I had no idea that you were supposed to wash your rice. Or I mean, and then also I just use the word supposed to. It's like that's all relative to your own experience. So yeah, I think it was it made me angry that I couldn't I felt like I couldn't please anybody. Um so Again, grad school, not the answer to kind of be like, well, here's this, but it was a way forward for me. Right. So growing up in such a different race, obviously, is quite jarring, right? And naturally, your parents didn't necessarily treat you differently, but did other people treat you differently growing up? Because they say, hey, wait a minute, like you have white parents, but you're Asian sort of thing. Did you, what was your experience in that? So I think weirdly enough, I don't, I'm sure it happened, but I don't have any strong memories of like the adoption thing being something that people acted like I was super different about. Minneapolis is a fairly, you know, progressive city, however you want to define that. And Minnesota's actually has the highest rate of Korean adoptees in the United States. So being an Asian kid with white parents wasn't the weirdest thing to see in oh. Minnesota. So yeah, like, I don't think I, ha- I don't have any strong memories of anyone doing the whole like, oh, why didn't your parents want you or that kind of thing. Again, I'm sure it happened. I have also blocked a lot of that stuff out. So yeah, so a lot of it was just kind of like, stuff that I think honestly, a lot of just Asian American kids in general have experienced. And this is kind of like one of the few things I've been able to relate to non-adopted Asians about is experiencing racism. So things like on when we're having a unit on China or something, then people expecting me to know something about it. Um, Or um, obviously the like, where are you from? No, where are you really from? question and I'm like uh Minnesota and that's apparently not a good enough answer for them right. so things like that but I I feel like that was mostly being coming from kind of racial difference rather than me being adopted but I think the not asking I mean I still got invasive questions I guess about being adopted but thing like bullying for example that probably was the result of a it wasn't that unique to be an Asian adoptee in Minnesota and be probably, you know, kids. I went to a really small school, so everyone knew I was adopted. So it was kind of probably kids' parents saying, here are the questions you can and can't ask that kid. It's like when you have a very uh, like visibly different kid in the class, the parents coaching their kids on the niceties of what is and isn't okay. So there is that. But I did just also remember that I feel like, and I don't know if you've experienced this too, when you share something about yourself that is different than whatever the norm is, so for me being adopted, people feel like they have the right to ask any question they want to you. So yeah. like, I definitely got questions, right, about like, oh, do you, do you want to meet your real parents or do you want to meet your birth parents? You know, right. how do you feel about being adopted? It'd be, oh, you're adopted. What's that like? So it's right. funny. I didn't even think of that when you asked. And I was like, I don't know. What's it like not to, you know? And so I guess I didn't even, th- those didn't, interactions didn't even come to mind when you asked if I was treated different because that was such a normal part of my upbringing. I, d- I always, I forget that that's not something that non-adopted people get, you know, right. that they don't get asked that. So that's very interesting, actually. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So obviously, yes, I definitely got treated different mostly through invasive questions though it was the same for me so i totally totally understand that i was very naturally for me i having white parents i looked similar to them so people didn't really believe me when i said i was adopted and i was like no no i'm I'm from russia and growing up like i had a bit of a a russian accent and the question that i would get a lot is why do you have an accent and they don't sort of thing. I had to take mm. like language classes. I had to lear- lose my accent. I had to make sure I understood and, and learned um, English very perfectly. And uh, eventually like I would have to get yeah. my citizenship. So it was uh, a yeah. lot different for me. And I, I did get a lot of the unwanted, like were you, why weren't you wanted sort of questions. But 
I guess it's a little comforting for me to know. So I don't know how to interpret that because part of me is like, well, it's, it's comforting that you didn't really have to experience that. But at the same time, I'm also like, yeah, but the, the questions that people ask are very insensitive in a very different way, because this is something that I've yeah. never experienced. I mean, no one wants to ask about Russia, right? Um, especially yeah. with now what's yeah. going on in the world. Um, yeah. You know, but so, I mean, how would that make you feel when people would, would ask you those sorts of questions? I mean, I, I, for me, it would, it would probably make me feel angry. I'm just trying to, I can't, I know I can't put myself in your shoes, but I could, if I could imagine being in your shoes, I would be quite irritated where it's like, that was rude. Like, why would I know about this? I'm from Minnesota. Yeah. I think, sort you of know, thing. the questions about, you know, right. I'm from Minnesota. Like I grew up on <laughs> Culver's. I think the questions at least about like, just being adopted specifically to me i didn't think they were weird or i didn't get offended by them because i got asked them so many times that i didn't know that like i didn't know asking if you want to meet your biological parents or anything like that i didn't know that was rude i didn't know right. that that was something that is a i didn't even know that was a personal question to ask someone i didn't realize that until i was an adult right that, and i had this awakening of like oh my gosh wow, that's a really invasive, you know, or people would ask two right. questions about my parents and their fertility and stuff. And they probably wouldn't love that I'm sharing their, you know, issues conceiving publicly, but whatever. Um, and, but like, people would ask those questions. And I'm like, do you, why are you asking me about first of all, I don't want to think about my parents trying to conceive. Second of all, right. I don't know right. why you want to know what was going on for me. like, that's also very personal. Like, so I think, you know, that stuff I realized later on was not okay and weird. But as a kid, it happened so much that I just kind of, it would be, it felt similar to like, if I was wearing a big clown costume out in public one day, and people were staring at me, it's like, well, you know, I kind of asked for this. So I almost felt like, well, this is just my kind of cross to bear because I'm adopted of like, almost like, they're allowed, you know, I, I, I did something somehow to deserve this, even though obviously we know now right. that's not the case, but yeah, it was so normalized to me. And I don't think I really had, I don't think I really had anyone telling me that that wasn't okay, that that was, you know, Minnesota, if you've heard right. of Minnesota, nice too. We do not stir conflict. We are taught and socialized in that state to just kind of be polite about it. And then talk right. about you behind your back later on but right <laughs> yeah right. so you know I was also taught to be pretty non-confrontational so I know people kind of recall that when I was a kid I was a very prickly kid is the word that's been used to describe me um so I think when people would probe too far I would sort of freeze up and I don't know they would say I was sassy and I don't you know I think we can imagine sort of how they were interpreting me trying to establish very normal boundaries but you know people would say I was being like sassy to them or something like that which was probably me just saying okay too far you know asking what country I'm from fine but anything beyond that I don't know things with China kind of kind of similar to what you were saying of you know being from a country that is not does not have friendly relations with the United States is complicated and mm -hmm. Like you said, it's yeah. getting extra weird right now and right. stuff. So um, I remember definitely as a kid, kids saying something about like communist spy or something. And in kindergarten, yes. I'm thinking, who taught you the word communism? And, <laughs> you know, where did you learn that? You know? Yeah, 100 percent. I mean, I've I've been called yeah. Anna Chapman for pretty much all of my life. And now I've taken it as yeah. a term of endearment. If you don't know, Ch Anna Chapman was like a very famous Russian spy in America. Okay, She's like one yeah. of the successful ones and was hailed as a hero in Russia. So I get called Anna Chapman by, or I used to get called Anna Chapman by a lot of, lot of kids, a lot of people. Yeah. Anytime I would tell people I'm Russian, they'd be like, oh, you're Anna Chapman. And it's like, you know, there's more <laughs> to, to the culture and more to the people yeah. than like, and more to Russia than you know Putin and spies, right? Like, it's it's right, interesting. Exactly. I find it. so in in your research, which we're gonna get into for sure. Um, I just want to touch on this subject really yeah. quickly about stereotypes 
have do you feel like people yeah. have stereotyped you the way that I have been stereotyped pretty much all my life? You know, apparently like yeah, I'm obsessed yeah. with vodka and you know, there's like of course. <laughs> I'm I'm a spy. You love the cold. Things, right? <laughs> you know. Yeah, uh. yeah. <laughs> See, I get the cold thing, but that's just because I'm from Minnesota and I hate the cold. And I kind of reverse that one and say, I am from a much warmer climate. Originally, I was not made for this place. Um, I do not like the cold. And yet yeah. I have lived in the Midwest my whole life. And I don't think I'm gonna, I like living in the Midwest, actually, despite our winters. The winters it's nice. are yeah. horrifying. But yeah, I think First of all, there was obviously always the one of Asians are good at math. I'm terrible at math because both of my adoptive parents, my dad was an architect who failed calculus like twice, I think. Uh, and my mom is a journalist. So neither of them were good at math. So math wasn't something that was ever emphasized in my household. And I am terrible at it. My sister happens to be really good at it. And she did that all on her own because no one in our house was helping her. But Right. Um, she's also just a lot smarter than me. But anyway, so mm -hmm. yeah, like I wasn't good at math, but I kept getting put in honors math classes and then having to go into remedial like after school math lessons to catch up because I was failing all of these classes because I'm just not good at math and that's right. okay. Oh. So, you know, there were things like it that is. or just academic achievement in general. Definitely got that like Asian model minority stereotype of I and being, you know, a woman and being an adoptee the idea of me being very docile, like I had kind of all the little uh, identity markers that would suggest me as stereotypically docile kind of thrown at me. And I think that's part of why I was characterized as being very prickly is because I yeah. just wasn't, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't even know what they wanted from me in terms of docility. I was a very well-behaved student, but like if I ever, I talked back. So definitely yeah, things about like being good at school, being very like obedient, sweet, docile. Um, I think those are things I got a lot. And that was kind of the adoption stuff, adoptee part and the Asian part and like gender stuff all kind of getting lumped together. And with the docility to, you know, East Asia was really attractive for a lot of white parents to adopt from because we already had these kind of preconceived notions of Asian women specifically as being really submissive and subservient. And so yeah. whether it was conscious or not, a lot of the parents were like, oh, this will be a much easier kid to assimilate than, you know, another child of color, especially in contrast to like, there's a lot of, you know, discrimination against adopting black kids in the US, especially. Yeah. And so Asia was the alternative. Yeah, no, I I totally, as soon as you started talking about it, I was thinking back to even when I did like my undergrad and I was studying about just Asian culture. And that is definitely one of the, the stereotypes. It's one of the top stereotypes about Asians yeah. in America and just in general that, you know, when you say docile, I, I totally understand what you mean, where it's like the women are supposed to be like gentle and very... I, I just, I totally understand what you mean. I can't, I can't think of the right yeah. word right now, but I, I can think of it. I can, I can actually like see it in my, my mind where they move very grace, graceful, very graceful, very gentle, yeah, very docile. Yeah, yeah. Very calm. I mean, I got you know, the name grace. Um, even the way that like, the tea is poured. It's not like the way that I pour my tea. Yeah. I, I, I take a fist and I go near, kind of, you know, but there's a much more like elegant way that it, it is. The tea is very explicitly poured in China, Japan, and South Korea. And it's yeah. beautiful. Like the whole tea ceremony is yeah. actually just such a beautiful, beautiful thing. And yeah. I've, I've always loved uh, Asian culture just because of the beauty of it. I like studying cultures because I think each culture is beautiful yeah. in its own way. Um, so I like to just appreciate the world and the cultures that are around the world. But now I would like to start talking about your research and what you're doing in your yeah. PhD program. So I want to, I want to know, like, what have you discovered so far for your research? I'm very excited to hear this yeah. and talk about it and bring it to everyone's yeah. attention. Yeah. So I guess kind of some context of where I'm at in the program is I almost done with all of my field work. So in anthropology, we do like coursework exams, and then we do a year of field work before we start writing. So I have one more interview left and I'm almost done with my field work. And I interviewed adult Asia, East and Southeast Asian adoptees who were raised in white households in the U.S. 
So my participants range from like 18 to 56, I believe is my oldest one. But most of them are between the ages of like 25 to 35, I would say. Mm. And so, yeah, I'm almost done with that, which is great. And so this is a perfect time to start like thinking about and unpacking all of these interviews I've done. But basically some big things I've seen is just kind of this, con- like what we were talking about earlier of like, you know, where do I fit in? What is community? And um, what I've been kind of grappling with in my interviews and the other parts of my work is, is there kind of this cohesive adoptee community that we can point to? You know, because being adopted is such a complex and um, kind of diverse identity. Is there enough shared there to really form, a, excuse me, a community? And I'm kind of still working through in terms of like theory, how I would define community and stuff. And so what I've seen a lot um, in terms of like online kind of social networks, at least, is that my participants and myself included have kind of used online spaces, whether that's Facebook groups, using Instagram, TikTok, what have you. Those have been more spaces for educational stuff, people posting infographics or little um, reels and stuff, or um, people using Facebook groups to kind of find support, whether it's, oh, I had this really weird experience. Have you had this experience? And I've seen Mm. that I think a lot of people are kind of trying to find these sort of social mirrors that they didn't have growing up. So since a lot of us didn't grow up with other Asians, we don't, it's kind of like how to be Asian. But then like what we talked about earlier, you find other Asians and they're not always, you know, I'm not saying the Asian American community as a whole, right, is against adoptees, but it's hard to understand where we fit into other Asian American communities when we have these really different upbringing. So, so it's like, you're not really finding those mirrors. Yeah. And you're not finding those mirrors with other Asian Americans. Like I think a lot of us think we might. And so the adoptee community or adoptee spaces becomes a great place to find someone who like looks Asian has experienced a lot of the racism that Asian people have faced, but also doesn't wash their rice or doesn't like eating. It doesn't have like a stinky lunch story. One of my participants put it like that of you know, I can only be so Asian because I don't have a stinky lunch story where my kid, where our classmates made fun of me for bringing fish or something to school. Like my right. mom packed SpaghettiOs for me. Right. <laughs> so I think that's been a really weird thing that I've been kind of figuring out is what does the adoptee community look like? How might we define it and understand how it's used? And And I've noticed a lot of people don't really stay kind of fully in it, it's not like, for example, a uh, fitness, like people that really like fitness. I am not one of them, to be clear. So this is me just <laughs> drawing conjecture right. on what a fitness-oriented community would look like. But people that are really into fitness, oftentimes they'll meet regularly and do right. their little workouts and maybe talk about it and, you know, are really invested in kind of um, having this space that is sustained Whereas I see a lot, I've seen a lot more adoptees kind of will kind of go in and then exit the adoption spaces as, you know, their life changes or as they notice that kind of as they right. realize different ways in which their adoption has impacted their life. So some someone might start like a lot of people start to think adoption about adoption critically in college. So yeah. What does it mean to be adopted? What does this mean for racial identity? Kind of go in there for that. And then they might get their first job and their doing life kind of goes on differently. But then maybe they're going to have a biological kid, which obviously for adoptees is very complicated or, you know, starting a family or dating. And then they might go back into the adoption community for advice on like, how do I navigate this world? Or maybe they'll even find a subgroup of like adoptee parents or something and sort of come back in and then they go back out. So it's something where I think people enter and exit a lot based on sort of these stages they are at their life or person or individual needs. Because I think one of my participants shared that like being adopted, this thing that happened to us that we didn't have any control over and then having us be so spread apart, that's not always enough to keep us together for a long period of time. It's something Mm. that kind of informs other things. So that was a really, I mean, I I wish I could quote it directly. I just, you know, 
cannot remember it verbatim, but um, they put it really well, really beautifully. And I think that's something that, yeah, you're, right now you're getting a lot of half-baked ideas because that's kind of where I'm at. But that was no, another wanna, really interesting, wanna... um, really fascinating part. Oh, yeah. I mean, all of this is really, it's he hearing about all of this is, because really quickly, I want to touch on this, this idea yeah. of community. And for me, I feel like I can talk about it a little bit in a general sense for for adoptees in general, because what you said holds very true, not just for the community that you're investigating, but for communities in general. So I am also a part of multiple adoptee communities. And I what I mm -hmm. find is even with the podcast, like what we're trying to do is we are trying to build a community of adoptees, regardless of where you're adopted from. And people kind of come in and out, yeah. things like that. And it's it's a very similar sort of sentiment. Even with a Facebook group, it's I'm I'm part of multiple adoptee Facebook groups because I want to be surrounded. The idea of a community and like the definition of a community is where like-minded people kind of go and they gather, right? That's that's more right. or less the the general definition of it. Uh, yeah. A group of like-minded people are all congregating in one space, and it can be physically, like you said, online sort of thing. What I notice is there needs to be a sort of way that people will want to feel engaged and want to feel like they should be a part of this community and should engage in it. And I think that is often a very yeah. difficult thing to do within any community, whether it's about adoptees or whether it's not about adoptees. There are so many people who have great ideas for communities and it's always hard to get the retention from other, other people. What is your what is your understanding of a community in relation to obviously like the adoptees, but also just a community in general? Like I, I feel like if we do a compare and contrast sort of analysis, maybe we can also like help along this idea of what you're trying to dissect here. Yeah, I think, you know, cause yeah, I have been, I mean, this is, these are the thoughts that keep me up at night right now. And uh, right. what does community mean? What does belonging mean? Yeah, it's gotten very esoteric here in the last few uh, months. But right. for me, something I've been thinking about a lot is like, what is the role of kind of joy and celebration in a community? It, like, and so with, you know, the idea of an adoptee community, like I and my participant mentioned is like, that is kind of, if we understand adoption through this critical lens of knowing, you know, um, the psychological and emotional trauma, the losses, the systemic inequities that go into adoption. If we understand adoption as the product of that and not necessarily this ha always happy thing, then a community around something that's quite sad isn't something that I think a lot of people want to be a part of for a very long time, because that's kind of a big bummer. <laughs> so it's kind of how do we find celebration or joy in our communities? And so I think for me, a community that is at least sustained or a community that I would like to see is one that can also, that is kind of centered around either action or joy or kind of trying to build. A community, I think, is something that for me orients around building, whether that is, you know, in my context, like trying to build better academic frameworks to understand adoption and how we connect to each other and the world. So, and I've kind of seen that happen a bit in different. So my research does not look at Facebook groups at all, because that has like, for me, that has some more privacy layers that I'm not comfortable going into where on Facebook, I can't, those are closed Facebook groups. And I can't continuously say, I'm a researcher, I'm a researcher. And so when people share that, I can't be sure that everyone knows that I am taking data from those groups. So I do not look at Facebook groups. I look at like public Instagram, which you know, if it's out there, it's out there. Um, that kind of stuff, TikTok, stuff that is meant for public consumption. So I should have mentioned that. But anyway, but on a personal note, when I've seen Facebook groups, you know, I see people who I see them kind of get more and more niche of like, you know, queer Asian adoptees, queer Asian adoptees in Chicago, adoptee, Asian adoptees in grad school, you know, like they get really specific where there is, there are a couple more kind of touchstones where we can find commonality and then build something out of that. So 
I think so, sometimes I feel like maybe just being adopted or just being an Asian adoptee, since we're such a big population, it's it's hard to find, think of that as the sustained community that could like potentially all gather, but kind of finding other ways in which we engage with being adopted, that might be a different way of looking at things. So are you only looking at adoptees, uh, Asian adoptees in America, or are you doing it internationally? Yeah. Okay. So just in the United States, some of that is, I mean, I think some of my part- people who were raised in the United States, I should say, because some of my participants are like studying abroad or living elsewhere, um, but they had most of their upbringing in the U.S. And so I did that mostly to kind of situate like that process of racial identity formation within the kind of more specific context of U.S. racial hierarchies, because being Asian in, say, Switzerland or, or Sweden, I meant, sorry, <laughs> being Asian in Sweden, where there's still a very high population, they have the highest rate of Korean adoptees. That is a very different experience than being Asian in the United States that is a very racially diverse place, where Sweden tends to be more racially homogenous. So that's kind of why I did that. And also to just give myself a more narrow scope. Yeah. Right. I see. Yeah. You're, you're focusing in on a specific uh, area. So what is yeah. one of the most, you feel, what is one of the most important things that you have discovered so far in your research? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah. Like what is something that really stuck out to you that you're like, wow. I think for me, I think it was really finding out that there are plenty of adoptees who did not feel at home in whatever adoption community they were a part of. And the kind of, you know, we talked about the grief or the loss of not feeling accepted in the Asian community and then still not feeling fully accepted in the adoptee community either. Some participants shared that like, it's because, you know, it's hard to, for example, be queer in a lot of like majority adoptee spaces where the majority of those adoptees are straight or cis. And so I think it was that finding out how just how many people still feel kind of isolated from the adoptee adoptee spaces. I think that was something that was kind of, you know, sad to hear, but also not surprising and kind of a good reminder for me and hopefully other people that just like, for example, being in reunion with your biological parents isn't this end point of, okay, now I'm settled with myself. Finding an adoptee community of people with similar experiences, that doesn't mark an end point. It usually opens up more questions. Okay, now that I'm finding right. all these different ways to engage with my identity. So I think, well, I knew on a personal level that, you know, being adopted, navigating adoption is a never ending journey. I think hearing that from so many of my participants and kind of seeing the way that plays out online was really important. It's something that I really want to find a way to kind of center at least, or have that at least be a big part of any message I put out in the dissertation of like really understanding that, you know, um, for everyone, adoptees, non-adoptees, you know, for everyone, time isn't linear healing. You know, I don't think for me personally, I don't feel like being adopted is something I need to heal for myself. It's just a part of who I am. Mm -hmm. And it gives me this lens to view the world that is critical, that understands that kind of every part of who I am is related to something else that has happened. And so it makes me feel connected to the world in a way. So I think it was nice to hear that from other people. And it's something that I hope can kind of be explored more because I don't think I can get through all of that in one dissertation and I don't plan to write another one. So yeah. Right. So adoption is obviously each individual's own journey and they can yeah. choose whether they can choose what points of the adoption specifically to focus on. I know another part of your dissertation yeah. that you're writing is about media. And I, I do want to talk about this because I am also uh, writing something about adoption and how it's portrayed in the media, how adoptees are portrayed, yeah. how the how the constellation is portrayed. And I'd like to talk about that with you. And I wanted to see what your research has discovered, because for me, I... I've analyzed a few different films and I find that there are very common stereotypes for 
adoption in general. But I would like to know specifically for the Asian American community, the Asian American adoptee community, what you have discovered as far as this uh, constellation goes in media. Yeah. So um, my focus is primarily on like social media. So I tend to put most of my analysis on kind of adoptees, how they are representing themselves on social media, which has been super fascinating, actually, because one thing I like, you know, when we've been talking about, you know, community adopt adoption isn't always enough to kind of sustain community. You know, you need to sometimes other parts of yourself into it. I've seen adoptees get really creative on social media of how they talk about, represent their adoption, their adoption story, or, um, you know, counter narratives about adoption through other hobbies. So there's a TikTok, Instagram account of twins who do uh, like fitness. Again, I'm not a big fitness person, so I don't know why it's come up multiple times <laughs> and I'm showing how little I work out, but like they do fitness things, but then we'll also insert like adoption content. Um, a lot of it will be kind of reacting to maybe problematic comments on, uh, you know, comments saying you should be grateful and them just kind of saying, uh, laughing at those jokes and they're not those jokes, those comments, laughing them away, but also explaining why that's not, you know, accurate. appropriate, um, accurate and, um, them kind of also sharing what I like about their content is they also kind of, they're laughing, they're, expressing some kind of joy not that we have to be happy all the time but they're kind of i i get the sense that they are sort of trying to kind of reclaim their voice in a very empowering way so i think that's really cool and i've seen a lot of there's one account who she um focuses on like language learning and stuff she knows about like language acquisition and adoption isn't as foregrounded in her work but she will sometimes talk about the way that being adopted has impacted her desire to learn multiple languages um, and why it's harder to connect with some languages than other just because of that kind of loss of culture and stuff. So I think that's really fascinating. So, I mean, you know, there's people that do more like influencer-esque things like day in my life with my kids, but also I'm adopted. So here's how that's playing into it. So I think you know, adoptees representations of themselves on social media, I think is showing a lot of possibilities for how we can look at adoption in this really nuanced way of it's not, adoption isn't something where we have to always just have that be at the center, but understanding how adoption plays a role in these like really mundane aspects of our everyday life too, and the things that we choose to do. So I, that's been really cool. And especially seeing that in contrast to representations of adoptees that are usually not made by us and made by Hollywood or sometimes adoptive parents who want to push a certain narrative or something like that. It's been for me really refreshing to see people, yeah, kind of reclaim their narratives on their own pages. And I think social media has been a way to put those counter narratives out there, put out, put out counter narratives that maybe um, a movie production studio wouldn't want to pick up or, um, circulate so yeah so for my last question i'm gonna see if i can make it a good one <laughs> so what is one of the things that you hope this dissertation will accomplish well first i hope it'll get me out of grad school obviously because very tired but right. <laughs> you know the thing is is so i think i you know, my goals with the dissertation are surprisingly not too dissimilar from what they were when I started out, which was kind of you like by trying to take a more nuanced view of adoptee experiences, of understanding of how we can understand our relationship to racial, cultural identities, how we can understand our relationships to other adoptees. If we can do a more nuanced view where it like, for example, being a critical adoptee doesn't mean you have to be an adoptee abolitionist, potentially. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Or being an Asian adoptee doesn't mean that you have to go learn your mother tongue or something like that. Like being able to just kind of appreciate the different ways of being adopted, being Asian. I want that to feel liberatory for adoptees. 
because I think so much of our experiences is feeling like we have to fit into these little boxes of, you know, um, American, non-American, white, Asian, whatever. And now through my research, finding out, oh, also a, there's some box too of how to be an adoptee within the adoption community. We're sometimes doing this to ourselves, which is unfortunate. And so by trying to, A, highlight that this is that kind of like pigeonholing adoptees in our own community, kind of identify that that is happening a bit, unfortunately, and then saying it doesn't have to be that way. I feel like that's that's kind of what I want to come out. It's just this understanding of, I don't know, trying to reclaim just like who we are as people and that there can be a lot of different ways to engage with all these different wonderful, horrible aspects of being alive. That makes it sound very wishy-washy. But um, yeah, I want it to just feel liberatory in some way because it definitely has been for me while doing this research. I feel really honored and appreciative that I get to hear all these stories. And through hearing the stories, I've had really different kind of realizations about my identity as an adoptee, my relationship to the adoptee and adoption community. And for me, it has been empowering to be like, um, I don't know, not not like this narrative about adoption of meet someone else who, <clears throat> meet it's other okay. adoptees who have the same unpopular opinions. So I would like to wish you good luck in finishing your dissertation. You totally got this. I'm very confident in what you're doing. And I just appreciate uh, that you're conducting research about this. I'm very excited. And I don't know, I'd like to actually see it one day, like once it's all done. I totally yeah, love to read yeah. it. Yeah, I'd love to share it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And thank you so much. And thanks to the po- you know, all the podcast folks for having me. This was really fun. And are you still in school too, by the way, working on your I, degree or are you... So what I'm doing is I am actually writing my, um, I've written a dissertation proposal. Um, well, it's okay. not really a dissertation proposal, but it's a proposal to get into the school. And they said they wanted to see okay. more of it. So now I have to write over 5,000 words for them just as a sample oh of gosh. what I'm trying to accomplish. I know. I know. That's so, so I'm much. A little stressed okay, about well, it, but... that's a luck. You also got this. I mean, I think, yeah. You know, I guess the other thing I would want to come out of this is the more, you know, adoptees we have doing this kind of work and in different disciplines, you know, the better, because I think that is really ultimately what's going to create that kind of sense of belonging is not having to fit ourselves in. So showing all these different ways that we can tackle adoptee academia, adoptee social spaces and all of that. So best of luck to you, too. Thank you. And honestly, I, I totally agree with you. But I would like to thank everyone for joining me on this episode of Chats with Cat. A very special thank you to our guest, Grace. Everyone stay tuned for another episode of Chats with Cat on the Voice of Adoptees podcast. Don't forget to like, subscribe, rate, and share this episode so that Grace's voice and story can be heard. And always, always remember, someone somewhere is thinking of you. You are not alone. <laughs>